Well, hello, family and friends. We are back in our element. We are caught up again. It is day 164. So today we are doing lessons 163 and 164 to get us back on track. I'm so excited. Thank you for your prayers. I am healed. My sickness is gone. I'm caught up on my rest. I am back in the groove. So I hope you are excited for the word of God today because we are watching Solomon continue to build not only the temple, but also so his own palace and we get to see Jesus revealed through it all. So if you are new here to this Bible study, please let me know where you're watching from. And I just want to let you know that everything that you need can be found in the description box below. If you want to be connected with us closer in this community, please join our Facebook group. That link is also below. I am going to be throwing around some ideas toward the end of the year because I want you guys to be involved in next year's project. As we start to embark upon our podcast and doing more subjective studies, I want to do it with you. I want you to be a part of it. So I'm going to be tossing some ideas out there, having conversations so that everyone can have a little bit of input as to why things are the way they are. I want to get other people's thoughts on things so that I am not just throwing out information and it's just settling on soil. I want us to nourish it. I want us to come together as a community and build out this harvest. It's going to be amazing and I hope that you will want to be a part of that too. Also, if you could help us out by giving this video a thumbs up if this Bible study helps you out in any sort of way so that we can get these videos spread out to other channels of those who might be seeking the Word of God. So we thank you, Lord, for this day. We come together in fellowship corporately, Lord, if you will. And we just want to be in your presence. We want to worship you and praise you and acknowledge you through your word, Lord. We want to be fed, but we also want to be able to pour out that blessing back onto you. So we are so grateful today for what you are going to speak. Help us, Lord, to be ready to receive it. I pray that our eyes, ears, and hearts are open. Let our soil be ready. Let it be nourished. I pray that you'll bring the water, God, because the harvest is about ready to blow out. And so we are excited for that. And I just pray that you'll meet every single person where they're at. Will you please, Lord, do a work in our hearts today? Let the meditations of our hearts, our thoughts, our words, everything that we do be pleasing to you. Let these not be my words today, Lord, but yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. By the way, I got me some new highlighters. I will link these below. I've bought them off of Amazon. They're Mr. Pen. They do not bleed. I'm excited about them. My highlighters were drying out and I could not find the uh, refills for my other ones in stock. So these are pretty good. I like them a lot. Starting off here in 1 Kings chapter 7, Solomon has just finished building the temple and we will see him furnish it in just a bit, but now he's on to building his palace. So Solomon was building his own house 13 years and he finished his entire house. He built the house of the forest of Lebanon. So that's what it was called. He built it so that it would mimic a forest, like a grand forest. Its length was 100 cubits and the breadth 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. And it was built on four rows of cedar pillars with cedar beams on the pillars. It was covered with cedar above the chambers that were on the 45 pillars, 15 in each row. There were window frames in three rows and window opposite window in three tiers. All the doorways and windows had square frames and window was opposite window in three tiers. And I'm gonna turn on this light because I just realized I don't have it on, sorry about that. And he made the hall of pillars. Its length was 50 cubits and its breadth 30 cubits. There was a porch in front with pillars and a canopy in front of them. And he made the hall of the throne where he was to pronounce judgment even the hall of judgment. Now this was a place where he was able to hear higher law cases, things that were not able to be settled in the lower courts or by the priests. It was finished with cedar from floor to rafters. His own house where he was to dwell in the outer court back of the hall was like workmanship. Solomon also had made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter whom he had taken in marriage. I'm like, I would, I would love that. <laughs> I would love to have my own house. I'm just kidding. My husband and I used to joke, and by the way, we have a very fun loving relationship. So if I ever say anything that kind of mocks him in any way, it's nothing that he would never hear me say in public. You know, we like to be able to to joke around with each other and kind of poke fun and even 
in a serious way, talk about our downfalls because we believe that we've come such a far way in our marriage that we are able to share our marriage woes so that we can hopefully help others. You know, I'm never doing it to make fun of him in any sort of way that would cut him down because I love my husband dearly. I would never be where I am without him. So just wanted to point that out. But we used to joke that well, he did anyway. He actually used to have like this little handbook that he'd written out in his 20s saying that he wanted to have a house separate from his wife and there would be just a tunnel under underground that connected them. And I think he sort of got that from the idea of his grandpa because it, his grandpa actually lived separately because he was a businessman, he was always busy. So he actually had a separate house where he would live during the day, I guess maybe to do his business workings and then he would come home at night. It was pretty interesting, but... He always thought that was funny. So I just kind of joked about that there. And I was like, can I have my own house too? Anyway, all these were made of costly stones. So quality limestone, all quality materials, cut according to measure, sawed with saws back in front, even from the foundation to the coping and from the outside to the great court. The foundation was of costly stones, huge stones, stones of eight and 10 cubits, and above were costly stones cut according to the measurement and cedar. The great court had three courses of cut stone all around and a course of cedar beams. So had the inner court of the house of the Lord and the vestibule of the house. Now Solomon took 13 years to build his house, which was technically a little less expensive than the temple, but still very extravagant. Some commentators even saying that it was even more extravagant than the temple. But none of that really matters to us. What really matters is to show that even though it took him seven years, it was so much faster than it took him to actually build his own house, which goes to show his initial dedication to the kingdom of God. And of course, we know that that dedication later changes. But nevertheless, he built it on a costly foundation. He used the most expensive and the strongest materials so that his house would be able to withstand anything. And so just the same as it is with us, as we continue to build out our spirit life, as we build out the kingdom, we have to have that firm foundation, the things that are unseen. So what goes unseen in your spiritual life? Well, that's things like being in the word. Are you doing that? Well, I know you guys are because you're here with me. We are in the word daily and not everyone sees that. People don't see us toiling day after day. They don't see us when we are on our knees in prayer. They don't see the tears that are falling, not only for our own lives, but for other people, when we are crying out to the Lord to save our family and our friends and those in need, when we are crying out to God to heal people of things that are not only hurting them physically, but also spiritually, people don't see those things. They are costly. They are sacrifices before the Lord and it pleases him. But not only that, it is so necessary for us to be able to build our faith. And now we move on to the temple furnishings. So going back from his house to the temple. And King Solomon sent and brought Hiram from Tyre. Now this is not King Hiram. This is a different Hiram, also known as Hiram. This was an Israeli Gentile. So he's his father was a Phoenician artist. His mother was a widow from the tribe of Naphtali, which we hear from here. His father, a man of Tyre, a worker in bronze, and he was full of wisdom, understanding, and skill for making any work in bronze. He came to King Solomon and did all his work. So again, Solomon making sure to seek out the best of the best in not only materials, but also workers. He cast two pillars of bronze. 18 cubits was the height of one pillar and a line of 12 cubits measured its circumference. It was hollow and its thickness was four fingers. The second pillar was the same. He also made two capitals of cast bronze to set on the tops of pillars. The height of the one capital was five cubits and the height of the other capital five cubits. There were lattices of checker wood for the wreaths of chain work for the capitals on the tops of the pillars, a lattice for the one capital and the one lattice work to cover the capital that was on the top of the pillar. And he did the same with the other capital. Now the capitals that were on the tops of the pillars in the vestibule were of lily work, four cubits. So beautiful pillars, beautiful outer work. The capitals were on the two pillars and also above the rounded projection, which was beside the lattice work. There were two 
hundred pomegranates in two rows all around and so with the other capital. He set up the pillars at the vestibule of the temple. He set up the pillar on the south and called its name Jachin. And he set up the pillar on the north and called its name Boaz. We learned about this yesterday that the meanings of these names were he will establish for Jachin and in him is strength, which, or uh, he is quick. So when people would come to the temple, they would see these two pillars and be reminded that not only was the temple established by God and it would remain because it is strengthened in him, but also a reminder for themselves that they too were established by God. They were a people of God and through his strength, they would be able to endure anything because he is quick to rescue them. So it's a reminder that Solomon was ruling also by godly appointment and also by the grace and the strength of God. So do we have these pillars in our lives? Heart check. Do you have reminders that your life is established in God and that in him is where your strength comes from? And then secondly, are you a pillar for other people? Are you being a pillar for those who come in contact with you to see that they are a child of God or that God loves them if they are not yet saved and that they are going to be able to find their strength when they are weak in Christ? Are you a pillar for others and do you have pillars for yourself? And on the tops of the pillars, was lily work. Thus the work of the pillars was finished. Then he made the sea of cast metal. It was round, 10 cubits from brim to brim and five cubits high and a line of 30 cubits measured its circumference. So these are 15 foot wash basins for ceremonial washing for the priests. Under its brim were gourds for 10 cubits compa uh, compassing the sea all around. The gourds were in two rows cast with it when it was cast. It stood on 12 oxen, three facing north, three facing west, three facing south, and three facing east. The sea was set on them and all their rear parts were inward. Its thickness was a handbreadth and its brim and all their rear parts are, was made like the rim of a cup, like the flower of a lily. It held 2,000 baths, so about 11,500 gallons, huge. He also made the 10 stands of bronze. Each stand was four cubits long, four cubits wide, and three cubits high. This was the construction of the stands. They had panels, and the panels were set in the frames, and on the panels that were set in the frames were lions, oxen, and cherubim. On the frames both above and below the lions and oxen, there were wreaths of beveled work. Moreover, each stand had four bronze wheels and axles of bronze, and at the four corners were supports for a basin. So much like the basins that were outside in the outer court of the tabernacle were able to be wheeled over to the priest for him to do the ceremonial cleansing, these two had wheels on them. The supports were cast with wreaths at the side of each. Its opening was within a crown that projected upward one cubit. Its opening was round as a pedestal is made, a cubit and a half deep. At its opening, there were carvings and its panels were square, not round. And the four wheels were underneath the panels. The axles of the wheels were of one piece with the stands and the height of a wheel was a cubit and a half. The wheels were made like a chariot wheel. Their axles, their rims, their spokes, and their hubs were all cast. There were four supports at the four corners of each stand. The supports were of one piece with the stands. And on the top of the stand, there was a half, sorry, there was a round band half a cubit high. And on the top of the stand, its stays and its panels were of one piece with it. And on the surfaces of its stays and on its panels, he carved cherubim, lions, and palm trees, according to the space of each, with wreaths all around. After this manner, he made the ten stands. All of them were cast alike of the same measure and of the same form. So the tabernacle only had one stand, whereas the temple has ten. So a lot more extravagant here. And he made ten basins of bronze. Each basin held forty baths. Each basin measured four cubits, and there was a basin for each of the ten stands. And he set the stands, five on the south side of the house and five on the north side of the house. And he set the sea at the southeast corner of the house. Hiram also made the pots, the shovels, the basins. So Hiram finished all the work that he did for King Solomon on the house of the Lord. The two pillars, the two bowls of the capitals that were on the tops of the pillars, the two lattice works to cover the two bowls of the capitals that were on the top of the pillars, and the 400 pomegranates for the two lattice works, two rows of pomegranates for each lattice work to cover the two bowls of the capitals that were on the pillars. The 10 stands, the 10 basins on the stands, and the one sea, and the 12 oxen underneath the sea.
Now the pots, the shovels, and the basins, all these were vessels in the house of the Lord, which Hiram made for King Solomon, were of burnished bronze. In the plain of the Jordan, the king cast them, in the clay ground beneath Succoth and Zerethan. And Solomon left all the vessels unweighed, because there were so many of them. The weight of the bronze was not ascertained. And if this is going over your head, don't worry. When we get into Second Chronicles and we rehash this, I will bring a little more light to each of these pieces. So Solomon made all the vessels that were in the house of the Lord, the golden altar, golden table for the bread of the presence, the lampstands of pure gold, five on the south side, five on the north, before the inner sanctuary, the flowers, the lamps, and the tongs of gold, the cups, snuffers, basins, dishes for incense, and fire pans of pure gold, and the sockets of gold for the doors of the innermost part of the house, the most holy place, and for the doors of the nave of the temple. Thus all the work that King Solomon did on the house of the Lord was finished, and Solomon brought in the things that David his father had dedicated, the silver, the gold, and the vessels, and stored them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. So now skipping over to Second Chronicles chapter 4 the temple furnishings. So he made an altar of bronze. This was the altar where the burnt offerings were made. This is the first thing that the people would encounter. And the idea was that you can't approach God without bringing a sacrifice. Now, thankfully, we always have access to God. We can come boldly to the throne room of grace because of the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. So that is good news for us today. Then he made the sea of cast metal. It was round, 10 cubits from brim to brim and five cubits high, and a line of 30 cubits measured its circumference. Under it were figures of gourds, again, the gourds in prep for ministering at the altar. And if the priests didn't wash, there was a potential for them to be killed. So we also must be cleansed by the blood of Jesus, because if we are not, if we're not saved, it will end in death, eternal death. And when we are cleansed by the blood, when we are saved, there's a continual washing that then happens by the word of God. For 10 cubits compassing the sea all around, the gourds were in two rows cast with it when it was cast. It stood on 12 oxen, so oxen symbolizing strength and productivity, which also represented the 12 tribes of Israel, the fact that there were 12. Three facing north, three facing west, three south, and three east. The sea was set on them and all the rear parts were inward. Its thickness was a handbreadth, and its brim was made like the brim of a cup, like the flower of a lily. It held 3,000 baths. He also made 10 basins in which to wash and five set five on the south side and five on the north side. In these, they were to rinse off what was used for the burnt offering and the sea was for the priests to wash in. So again, these would accommodate very large animals. That's why they were so big. And how does this apply to us today and to Jesus? Well, Jesus rinses our prayers as he is the one who is interceding for us before the Father. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we think that we are simply just praying to God, right? Well, we are praying to God. We are, he is one, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the triune God, the Trinity, the Godhead. But we have to also remember the significance of the fact that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. He is the one who is like our attorney. He is there advocating for us. So don't forget that, right? We, we've got to remember the significance of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, even though they are one God. And he made 10 golden lampstands as prescribed and set them in the temple. Now the lampstands were symbolizing the light of God's creation, but also the fact that God is light and that Jesus is the light of the world. The tabernacle only having one, again, 10 of them here in the temple. And I love that it says as prescribed, as prescribed, as modeled by the Mosaic law and set them in the temple five on the south side, five on the north. He also made 10 tables, this being the tables for the showbread, the showbread symbolizing communion and continual fellowship with the Lord. For us, Jesus is the bread of life. We have that continual fellowship with God because of Jesus and because of the bread that we are able to eat through his word. And he placed them in the temple, five on the south, five on the north, and he made a hundred basins of gold. He made the court of the priests. So this is the inner court that was where the most holy place would be, which was the place that only the priests could go, and the great court, which was for the people to come. 
Well, thankfully, once again, we have access to the most holy, the holy of holies, because of what Jesus did. No veil separating us from that holy place anymore. That was torn when Jesus died and breathed his last. And the doors for the court and overlaid the doors with bronze. So these doors represent the door to the Father. The door to the Father is Jesus. It says it in John 10 verse 9. Jesus was judged, which is the uh, symbol for bronze. Bronze is a symbol for judgment. He was judged. He took on all of our judgment for our sin. So these were doors of bronze. And he set the sea at the southeast corner of the house. Hiram also made the pots, shovels, and basins, and he finished the work that he did for King Solomon on the house of God. And of course, Jesus also ultimately finishing the work completely. And have we finished the work that God has called us to do? The two pillars, bowls, and the two capitals on the top of the pillars, the two lattice works to cover the two bowls of the capitals that were on the top of the pillars, and the 400 pomegranates for the two lattice works, two rows of pomegranates for each lattice work to cover the two bowls of the capitals that were on the pillars. He made the stands also and the basins on the stands and the one seed, the 12 oxen underneath it, the pot, shovels, forks, and all the equipment for these. Hiram Abai made the burnt of burnished bronze for King Solomon for the house of the Lord. In the plain of the Jordan, the king cast them in the clay ground between Succoth and Zerida. Solomon made all these things in great quantities for the weight of the bronze was not sought. I love this part that the weight of the bronze wasn't sought. This just goes to show that he wasn't keeping tabs. Now, a lot of ministries will keep tabs. I'm not going to sit here and say that that is a bad thing, but where it can become a bad thing is where the numbers start to matter more than the ministry itself, where people are counting numbers for their own glory, where they are counting the fellowship or they're counting the membership for their glory of the church rather than for the glory of God. But the other thing that we can focus on, which is even more important, is the fact that our sins were so innumerable that the weight of our sin couldn't even be counted and Jesus still bared that weight of our sin on the cross and he absorbed it so that we could live. But what's even more beautiful is that even in that amount of sin that is within our lives, he still loves us. He still calls us. So there's nothing that you can do except for blaspheming the Holy Spirit and completely walking away from him that will separate you from the love of God. So Solomon made all the vessels that were in the house of God, the golden altar, which was for incense, the tables for the bread of the presence, the lampstands and their lamps of pure gold to burn before the inner sanctuary as prescribed, the flowers, which were to represent either the garden of Eden or God's sovereignty over creation. I'm not sure that's what the commentary said, but it sounds good. But regardless, it's beautiful with these flowers, the lamps, and the tongs of purest gold, the snuffers, basins, dishes for incense, and fire pans of pure gold, and the sockets of the temple for the inner doors to the most holy place, and for the doors of the nave of the temple were of gold. So after the cross, Jesus went to the right hand of the Father. That is where he sits. Gold being the symbol of deity. That is where Jesus is on the throne, wearing the crown of gold, and he shares that inheritance with us. And now heading back over to 1 Kings chapter 8, the ark is now being brought into the temple, and this is a big deal. You know, the ark of the temple being where the presence of God dwells or where the Shekinah glory dwells. And this is almost like the opening ceremony to the Olympics. It's, it's, he's got all of the leadership there. It's a big celebration and it's really symbolizing the renewal of their covenant and just a giant celebration in the end. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel, before King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. So if you think about what's going on here, remember that the 
uh, temple was completed in the eighth month. So the fact that it's in the seventh month says that this is 11 months later. So this is almost like the grand opening. You know how stores will open and then they'll later on have a grand opening. And the reason why they probably did it in the seventh month is because it made it convenient for the people to be able to bring the fruits of the harvest for the celebration. And also, uh, one commentator actually said that this was the year of Jubilee, so it made sense for them to have this grand celebration during this year. And all the elders of Israel came and the priests took up the ark. So of course, this is the proper way to do it according to God's command. And they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priests and the Levites brought them up. So the reason why they have to do this is because they're ready for the temple to operate, but without the ark, they can't actually have the operations of the temple in place without the presence of God being there. And that's like our lives. You know, if the presence of God is not evident within our lives, if he is not present in us, Nothing that we do in ministry is truly going to be as successful as it would be when we have the presence of God with us. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. So this just goes to show that he is going above and beyond in the this celebration, and it shows the joy of the people to just willingly bring so many sheep and oxen that can't even be counted. Then the priest brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the Ark, so that the cherubim overshadowed the Ark and its poles. And the poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside. And they are to this day. There was nothing in the ark except two tablets of stone that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. Now, if you notice here in the Ark of the Covenant, there are the two tablets, which has the Ten Commandments written on them. Whereas before in the Ark of the Covenant, there were the two tablets, but there was also the rod of Aaron and a jar of manna. Now, we don't know where either of those things went and how they disappeared, but they have. So if we look at the symbolism of these things, the rod of Aaron and the jar of manna, those could potentially represent signs and wonders, things that people would look to to increase their faith. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it is the Word of God that remains and stands yesterday, today, and forever. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. This is incredible. The glory of the Lord. The priests couldn't even stand up under the weight of his holiness. I don't know if you've ever been in a place like this where God's weight and glory was so evident, the presence was so heavy that you were just brought to your knees. This is such an encounter with God that we should all crave. It is the visible presence of God, that Shekinah glory, and it gave people an incentive to be obedient and to live that holy life. So when you encounter God in such a powerful way, it will do the same thing for us. It will drive us to a place of desiring to live that life in holiness and in surrender to Him, but also to be obedient. Now, this is the same cloud uh, filling this house of the Lord that was with Israel in the wilderness in Exodus 13. It's the same cloud in Exodus 16 where God spoke to Israel. The same one in Exodus 33 that stood by the tabernacle and stood by the door of the tabernacle. The same one in Exodus 19 where God met with Moses. It's the same one in Leviticus where God appeared to the high priest in the cloud. It's the same cloud that was in the vision of Ezekiel where it was filling the entire temple. It's the same cloud that overshadowed Mary at conception when she she became pregnant with Jesus. It's the same cloud that received Jesus at his ascension. Now, Solomon said, the Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness, this thick darkness being the sign of God's transcendence. I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell forever. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of uh, Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David my father, saying, Since the day that I brought my people out of 
uh, Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, that my name might be there, but I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to David, my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well uh, that w- with what was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son who shall be born to you shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made. For I have risen in the place of David my father and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And I love that he keeps going back to the fact that this is a promise from God. This has nothing to do with anything that he did to get to this place of power. He acknowledges that it was a promise from God. He acknowledges that it was because of what David did in the past that he is now anointed king. And I have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And there I have provided a place for the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. So notice the order of things here. He blesses the Lord first. Then we're going to see that he is going to bless the house and then bless the people. So we should live out our lives this way every single day where the first thing that we do is seek the Lord. Seek First, the Lord and his righteousness, and then all the things shall be added unto you. Then we can ask for the blessings upon our home and upon our day. Then we will be able to offer words of encouragement because we will then be filled up whenever we are blessing the Lord. Our blessings return that joy, the return that blessing back to us. So now Solomon's prayer for dedication. This prayer is really nothing new. We're going to see a lot of the same words that had been spoken in the past by other people in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So starting off here in verse 22, then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. So he's got a posture of prayer. He is standing outside. He's not inside the altar because that wouldn't be appropriate since he's not a priest. He's just a king. So he's standing outside before the altar uh, and with his hands toward heaven. Now we will see instances in these chapters where there are sometimes he would pray standing, sometimes he prays kneeling. So there is no real prescription for the way we have to pray. We can pray standing, sitting, eyes open, eyes closed, heads bowed, heads not, arms up, arms not, you know, so just know that. But there are postures of prayer that can potentially place you in a position where you are more likely to hear. There's no better position than to be on your knees, head to the floor. That is, There's no other humbling position other than that, that you'll have no other choice but to focus on God and not get distracted. All right, where are we? Uh, He spread out his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. You have kept with your servants, David, my father, that you, what you declared to him, you spoke with your mouth and with your hand have fulfilled it to this day. So he first acknowledges God, who he is, the fact that he holds the universe in the palm of his hand and re, you know, recognizing the fact that we are so small. We are so little compared to the majesty and the greatness of God in both heaven above, on earth beneath, in the universe, and the fact that we know how huge the universe is, yet he holds it in the palm of his hand. Like, how incredible is that to recognize that and to acknowledge it? And he will continue with this long prayer. And this prayer actually shows that Solomon really had a full dependence on God in the beginning, along with his people. And he stresses in this prayer faithfulness of both God and the people for the sake of receiving these blessings from the Lord. Now, therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, what you have promised. So he declares that promise. He prays his promises. And if we don't, you know, pray the promise, if we don't appropriate in faith what God has promised, it's basically going to be left unclaimed. They're going to be unclaimed promises at the end of the age because people have just left them on the floor. They have not grabbed hold of them and said, Lord, you said you would do this. So help me to be able to walk it out. 
saying, you shall not lack a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel. He fulfilled this ultimately through Jesus. If only your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. Now, therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and in the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. So he is acknowledging that the presence of God cannot be boxed up within this temple. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Lord my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day. That your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you have said. So there he is giving and proclaiming this blessing to be upon the house. My name shall be there that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place and listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place and listen in heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear please forgive. So now that blessing upon the people, God, hear their prayers and forgive their sins. And when he says they are going to pray toward this place, this was the way that they would pray. They would actually face their bodies toward the temple. And there are some Jews who still do this, who still walk this out to this day. So here are some of the things that we are going to see. Seven only God situations that we will see Solomon pray. So his first request, he is basically asking for righteous judgment. If a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath and comes and swears his oath before your altar in the house, then hear in heaven and act and judge your servants, condemning the guilty by bringing his conduct on his own head and vindicating the righteous by rewarding him according to his righteousness. So when he says here in heaven, he knows that God will hear from heaven because he sees what we can't see. He knows what is hidden in our hearts. So he is acting in faith and speaking in faith that God will do what is just. So when there is doubt, only God can judge. He's the only one who knows ultimately the heart of man, every man and his intents and motives. Now, the second thing that uh, he is requesting for is forgiveness in the midst of defeat. So when your people Israel are defeated before the enemy because they have sinned against you, and if they turn again to you and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land that you gave to their fathers. Now, God did answer this prayer, and he will continue to answer this prayer when people walk this kind of life. Whenever they turn from their ways and ask for forgiveness, he will restore those who are truly humble and penitent. So in the case where there is defeat, only God can bring them back. Only God can restore them. Verse 35, when heaven is shut up and there's no rain because they have sinned against you. So this is speaking about drought. If they pray toward this place and acknowledge your name and turn from their sin when you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people of Israel. When you teach them the good way in which they should walk and grant rain upon your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. So only God, this is the third request, can replenish the rains in times of drought. Only God can restore our soul and refresh our soul when we feel so drained, when we have nothing left, when we are at the end of our ropes. Jesus is the one who will be able to come and bring that living water within us once again. The fourth request, again, another healing upon the land. If there's famine in the land, if there's pestilence or blight or mildew or locust or caterpillar, if their enemy besieges them in the land at their gates, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever plea is made by any man or by all your people, Israel, each knowing the affliction of his own heart. So this saying not only physical plagues, but plagues of the heart as well, because not every plague is visible and stretching our hands Uh, as stretching out his hands toward this house, then here in heaven, your dwelling place and forgive and act and render to each whose heart you know, according to all his ways for you and only you know the hearts of all the children of mankind, that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land that you give to our fathers. So in this time of destruction, only God knows the hearts of men and only God will be the one who will deal with the heart 
We must be people who are open and willing to receive that correction, that dealing that God will do within us. And if we're the people who are storing up bitterness on the other side of it, where people are actually afflicting us and causing harm and bringing a plague upon our heart, well, we have to be able to forgive that. We have to be able to provide that forgiveness and say, Jesus, I trust fully and know that your blood on that cross is not just for me. It is for all sin. And so I will forgive them, Lord, because you have forgiven them. Verse 41, likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm, because they know the power of God and they know their duty of showing the surrounding nations who God is. When he comes and prays toward this house here in heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. Now, he's talking about this house being called by the name of God, being a house of prayer being a place where people can come and receive salvation, receive healing. This is the very thing that Jesus got angry about when he was overturning the tables because the people were starting to gamble there. They were starting to extort money there. And Jesus was rightfully angry at the people for turning the house of prayer into a den of robbers. So fifth request is prayers by the foreigner who initially have no access to God. So in the time of denunciation, we are called to be the salt and light of the world. If we only look inward, we will ultimately become discontent with our own life. We will lose vision and where we were once Uh, hungry for the word, hungry to save the lost, we will lose that vision and we will no longer be on the path of being kingdom builders. Verse 44, if your people go out to battle against their enemy, now this battle, speaking of only battles that are waged in accordance to the divine guidance of God, according to Deuteronomy 20. So this is not just any war that they feel like fighting. These are battles that have been commanded directly by God. By whatever way you shall send them, and they pray to the Lord toward the city that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name, then hear in heaven their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause. Now this could be a request that is simply lost by disobedience. We saw it with Saul. We saw when he was called to fight certain people and he didn't, and because of his disobedience, he lost the war. So this is the sixth request and the seventh request also going to be regarding wartime, but in deployment, God will fight for you. He will fight for you when it is his battle that he is guiding you into, but he won't fight all battles because some battles are not for us to fight. If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. So this is relating to that very verse that says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to the land of the enemy far off or near. Yet if they turn their hearts in the land to which they have been carried captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors saying, we have sinned and have acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who carried them captive and pray to you toward their land, which you gave to their fathers, the city that you have chosen and this house that I've built for your name, then here in heaven, your dwelling place, their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions that they have committed against you and grant them compassion in the sight of those who carried your heritage, which you have brought out of Egypt from the midst of the iron furnace." Let your eyes be open to the plea of your servant and to the plea of your people Israel, giving ear to them whenever they call to you. For you separated them from among all the peoples of the earth to be your heritage, as you declared through Moses, your servant, when you brought our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord, our God. So in the time of defection, if a nation turns and gets captured, only God could turn their hearts back to him. Now we see Solomon's benediction. This is the preparation. Uh, He is praying here, and now he is going to 
have the power that prayer produces to be able to set things in motion, get things moving. Now, as Solomon finished offering all this prayer and plea to the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord. So it was said that he actually prayed on a platform where people could see him praying, where he had knelt with hands outstretched toward heaven. And he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice saying, blessed be the Lord. So praising God first, his blessing started with praise to God, who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promise, which he spoke by Moses, his servant. Ooh, I love how he says that not one word of God has failed. Are we able to say that? Can you say today, not one word that God has spoken to me has failed. Not one promise that God has spoken to me is going to come to pass. Well, think of it this way. If you still have breath in your lungs, if you were still able to wake up this morning, then that goes to show that the word of God that was spoken over you, say a year ago, three years ago, five years ago, when you were crying out to him, when you were on your knees, when you were so weighed down with anxiety, that word that God spoke to you that I will get you through this came to pass. The fact that you are able to wake up today goes to show that God still has you in his hand, that he is still walking with you and therefore his word hasn't failed yet. And we can trust that it will never fail because his word says so. His word is true. It doesn't change from the time that it was written till now all the way until Jesus returns. The Lord our God be with us. So he is now asking for God's continued presence as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to him to walk in all his ways. So now he's acting, asking for that continued guidance to not only walk in his ways, but to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his rules, which he commanded our fathers. Let these words of mine with which I have pleaded before the Lord be near to the Lord our God day and night, and may he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day requires. That all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God, there is no other. Let your heart therefore be wholly true, or other translations say, let your heart therefore be loyal or at peace, hence complete or perfect, to the Lord our God walking in his statutes and keeping his commandments as at this day. So he is challenging the people now, challenging their loyalty to God. Now, if we look at how powerful this prayer is, he starts here in this posture, this kneeling with his hands outstretched toward heaven. And our body posture, remember when I was saying there's no, there's there's not a more humble place than being on your knees, face, face straight down to the ground. It will reflect the posture of our hearts a lot of the time. Maybe not always, but prayer can put us into a position for the spirit to flow through us and for the blessings to then pour in. So he started off kneeling and then he stood. He stood up because he was basically saying, I am expecting for God to do something, to live out his promises. And he spoke with a loud voice. He spoke with articulation. And we too should do this. We should be standing on the word, standing on the promise of God and putting volume to our prayers, putting volume to our thoughts. I know I've said it before, but there comes a time where you're gonna have to speak from your mouth because that will declare your faith through the words that you speak. And there is power in the spoken word. And he is blessing the people through this word. When we speak blessings onto people, that is going to encourage them. It's going to strengthen their faith. So let us be people who act like Solomon, who stand up, boldly proclaim the goodness of God, pronounce joy, speak blessings over others, speak faith, speak encouragement, instead of just tearing people down. We ain't got time for that. No time to tear people down. We need to save. We are in the saving industry. We are in the kingdom building market. So let's get back to focusing on the right things, loving people, speaking to people, blessing people, honoring people, getting them saved, bringing them into the house. No one's going to want to come into the house where they feel like they are hated. All right, getting on to Solomon's sacrifices, verse 62. Then the king and all of Israel was uh, Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord. 
Check out how much he brought. Solomon offered as peace offerings to the Lord 22,000 oxen. What? 120,000 sheep. Who even has that many? Can we even see that in a field? So the king and all the people of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. The same day the king consecrated the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord. For there he offered the burnt offering and grain offering and the fat pieces of the peace offerings because the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small to receive the burnt offering and the grain offering and the fat pieces of the peace offerings. So Solomon held the feast at that time and all of Israel with him a great assembly from Lebo Hamath to the book of brook of Egypt before the Lord of God the Lord our God for seven days on the eighth day he sent the people away and they blessed the king and went to their homes joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had shown to David his servant and to Israel his people isn't it amazing that they recognize that God proved to be faithful to David. We continue to see the life of David throughout, even after he's physically gone. This is the kind of life we want to live, where people remember what God did through us. I love how this ends with a big old party, this grand celebration, and ultimately it is because they have spent time with the Lord. They have been in communion with Him. They have been in fellowship with Him, and because so, they are seeing the promises of His spoken word being fulfilled. They are able to look back and physically see the things that are coming to pass. So are we able to live our lives out this way? Are we going to be people who are bringing the sacrifices? What kind of sacrifices are are you bringing? We can easily bring sacrifices today. We don't have to kill 122,000 sheep or however many oxen. We can bring the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and gratitude every single day. And when we do that, when we live that life of gratitude and thankfulness, we will be filled up with so much joy and that joy being the evidence of God's blessing on our life because God's blessing to be blessed is to be happy, to pour forth happiness. And that's what God wants for us. He wants his children happy. So open yourself up to not only receive the blessing from God, to receive that joy, but to pour it out onto others. Because when you do that, you yourself will be refreshed. And you will be amazed how those sacrifices can feed another person for days, for weeks, for months, maybe even a lifetime. You will be amazed at what words you speak over a person that will give them just enough fuel to get through that next battle. I don't know if you have remembered a time where someone has spoken something into your life through the Lord himself. I believe that when words come from people that are encouraging, it is a word from God. It's like a love note from the Lord. And it sustained you through things that you never thought you could get through. It was a word that gave you just a little more oomph and a little more gas to be able to run a little faster through the thorns and through the forest where you were able to finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. And now we end here in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Thus all the work that Solomon did for the house of the Lord was finished. Again, it took him seven years. So it took some time. Ministry takes time. So if you feel like something is just taking way too long, it's been months, Lord. It's been a year, Lord. Well, look at this, seven years to complete the temple. Sometimes it takes time. And Solomon brought in the things that David, his father, had dedicated. And I love that we keep being reminded of what David did and how he helped to actually prepare this temple, prepare with the uh, people prepare with the materials and stored the silver gold and all the vessels in the treasuries of the house of God. Now the ark is being brought to the temple once again. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, leaders of fathers' houses of the people of Israel in Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. So let's go back to the significance of the ark. The ark was made of acacia wood and of shittim from Exodus 25, we know this, shittim wood never rots. It is, um, it, it is, grows out of dry ground, just the way that Jesus is never changing. You know, the exterior of this plant has thorns, symbolizing the crown of thorns that Jesus wore. 
but within the bark of the shittim tree there is there is a sap that comes out of that that has healing properties and of course we know that in Jesus by his stripes we are healed there's healing in the name of Jesus the fact that it's rooted on dry ground just like Jesus he was brought forth out of the earth and then it is covered with gold, the ark is, which symbolizes deity, and then the wood being humanity. So the ark of the covenant symbolizing Jesus, who was fully man and fully God. And all the men of Israel assembled before the king at the feast that is in the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came and the Levites took up the ark. And they brought up the ark, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The Levitical priests brought them up, and the king Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted and numbered. So it's above and beyond. I wrote over the top, but I think I meant above and beyond, because sometimes over the top means he shouldn't have done it. So I'm going to cross that out, and I'm going to say this was more like above and beyond. I like that better. This sounds a little rude. <laughs> Then the priest brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place underneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the Ark so that the cherubim made a covering above the Ark and its poles. And the poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside, and they are there to this day. So the poles were removed. Why? Well, they're no longer needed because before the poles carried the Ark of the Covenant because they were pilgrimaging throughout the wilderness, but they're not doing so anymore. They're now settled. And this looks to Jesus the way that in Jesus' first coming, he literally tabernacled among us, written in John 1 verse 14. But when he comes the second time, so when he is establishing his kingdom on this earth, the way the temple has been established, his kingdom will be permanently established just like this temple. That's why the poles were removed because the ark has now found its secure and permanent home. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, for all the priests who were present had consecrated themselves without regard to their divisions, and all the Levitical singers, Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun, their sons and kinsmen, arrayed in fine linen with cymbals, harps, and lyres, stood east of the altar with 120 priests who were trumpeters. And it was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison, in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, they said, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. This being another detail that we didn't read about that I love so much that we are ending with worship, that we are ending with the people coming together in music and in praise. And this goes to show the importance of us gathering together in fellowship corporately. This is not me coming against anybody who has chosen not to go to church. I am in no place to judge anybody, but according to the word of God, and I will stand on the word of God, when we worship together, it does something. It moves heaven. It moves something here on earth. Something happens. Something shifts in the atmosphere, and we ultimately shrink. We become smaller and less selfish when we come together with other believers, when we are able to come together in unity with one focus, that focus being on God alone, not on self. Because if we are going into church only focusing on ourselves and not ultimately on God, then yes, we will leave still empty. We will leave probably still hurting. We will leave feeling like people are looking at us and judging us. But if you come to church and you come into the fellowship with this desire to focus solely on God and you desire to be in unity with others, no matter what anybody says or does, you can't be broken. 
you are not going to be able to falter because no weapon that forms against you can prosper. So you've got to hold to that promise. You've got to hold on to that strength and strength is in numbers. God never intended for us to do life alone. That's the reason why he brought Eve to Adam. It is better to have people with us doing this life together. We've got to be a part of something bigger than just ourselves. And when we do, it blesses the heart of God because where there is unity, God will command a blessing. So it not only blesses him upward, but then it brings that blessing right back down onto us. So if you want to live a life that is blessed, then make sure that you are in fellowship with other believers. For some people, that means online. That means just here in this Bible study within our Facebook group. For some, it means church physically. I don't know what that looks like for you, but all I'm saying is don't isolate. Don't do this alone because the enemy loves to go after the ones who are on the outside and who are weak or injured. So we end here, Lord, with just a big fat praise, with our hands lifted to heaven, in full surrender, in full thanksgiving, with gratitude, with hearts that are just humbled before you. Lord, we thank you for what you have done. We thank you for who you are, and we acknowledge your presence today. We acknowledge your holiness and your glory that is among us. God, when your presence dwells, Lord, there is no room for anything else. There is no room for us to be worrying about all the stuff that is going on. When we focus on you and the presence that is all around us, Lord, we will be able to turn our eyes upward and forward and on your purpose. So help us to do that, Lord God. We thank you for this community and for this fellowship that you have blessed us so abundantly with. I pray that you will continue to dwell here in this place, that you will shift things in people's lives, that you will meet them where they are, that you will meet their needs, that you will bring provision just the way that you did with the Israelites. Lord, you have not changed. Your heart has not changed for your people. We are your people. And so we believe that your promises will still come to pass, that your word still will not fail. So as we continue to build out this life, this spiritual journey that we're on, as we continue in this life to build the kingdom, the fact that we've still got breath in our lungs, we know we are still on a mission. I pray that you will strengthen us, God. I pray that you will give us guidance, Holy Spirit, because we know and trust the word that you have spoken today here through Solomon, that you are going to be with us, Lord, every step of the way, that you will hear our prayers, that you will find those battles that you will forgive our sins Lord when we turn from our wicked ways and we seek your forgiveness and we walk away from what was before and we turn toward you you will hear you will forgive and you will heal our land. We pray that for our nation, God. We pray that for our communities too. Let it not just be all about us, Lord. Let us be people who are declaring these promises on a bigger scale because we don't want to just be so small, Lord, where we are only affecting just a small amount. We want to be wide open to be able to share your love and to show your light to the world and let it be ever pleasing to your heart. We love you. We bless you, Jesus. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I want to give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer. I'm going to put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. 
I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.